The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend on the show, we discuss talks from the most recent General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a bit of fun. I'm your host, Matthew Watkins. We're going to be discussing Elder John C. Pingree Jr.'s talk, Eternal Truth, and it is a heavy hitter, so we're going to buckle in for this one. And I've had my friend who we had on last season, you may remember him, his name is Eric Wells. Eric, thank you for joining me. And you actually called dibs on this talk as he was giving it, if I remember right. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, truth is an increasingly interesting and controversial topic in today's world, and I was excited to jump in on that action. So thank you for giving me that chance. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And again, this is a fantastic talk. Now, I, mean, I did a little bit of math on this talk. This guy has 63 footnotes in a 10 minute and 40 second talk, which is insane. I did the math. He's dropping a footnote every 10 seconds. <laughs> He's got some footnotes in here that are dissertation length, where one footnote has four different verbatim quotes from general authorities. And you got you to be careful when you're uh, talking about something as controversial as truth, right? They're meaty footnotes, too. And so we're going we're gonna to be talking a little bit about that. I am super excited. So without further ado, let's jump on into his talk. So overall impressions of his talk, other than the footnotes. The landscape that this talk comes into is really interesting. I felt like he was clear and and straightforward. At one point in the talk, he even counsels members of the church to be clear in speaking about truth and seems to demonstrate precisely the way to do that. And, you know, as I mentioned today, it's unfortunate that truth is such a controversial subject when in in all simplicity, truth is is truth. And that's such a valuable perspective for for members of the church to have in today's confusing society. So that's that's why I I felt so happy and just felt like you know jumping up as soon as I heard this talk because of the clarity and 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 the reasons in our society why this is so important today. Those are those were things that stood out to me as being being wonderful. You're right. We we're often said that we live in a post truth era, and boy, what a sad description that is. I was I was watching if. Maybe some of our listeners have seen it. The the documentary that came out last year, "What Is a Woman?" the the documentary very mixed feelings on a lot of that part. But one part really resonated with me and, and stuck out to me, where there's a college professor being interviewed, and he's starting to get a little uncomfortable with some of the questions about gender and sexuality. We're talking about gender and, and sex, and there's a lot of controversies there. If we're talking about a trans woman has all of the male physical characteristic, would that not be a male then? Couldn't, couldn't we plainly say this person is a male? Why are you asking the question? I think I, I, wa I want to understand sort of why that's so important. So if someone tells Just you... Just to, to sort of understand reality. Well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. I'm, I'm not so sure why, what social in interactions would have to do with with maleness or femaleness that would well, be... I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of, like, getting to the truth. It, it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and the if truth? You, and, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I, I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. And I said, boy, isn't that kind of a description of where we are in society right now? That just the idea, not, not even putting the sp specific truth into it yet, just the idea that there is a truth, that there is an absolute moral truth about certain subjects is so controversial. I remember President Nelson said just a few years ago, was it 2019? He said, contrary to the, contrary to the beliefs of some, there is such a thing as absolute truth. And I remember when he said, I said, oh, why this is not a controversial statement at all. And yet today we see certainly it is. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. <clears throat> it, it feels... It feels strange to me that people in our society, perhaps without even knowing, 
want to have it both ways. We enjoy the products of so many innovations in science and technology, which originally and currently still, I'm sure, have their roots in solid in investigative processes, right? Scientific inquiry has given us incredible things in our modern society. And they use these and are happy and have a comfortable life and then turn around and say, cool, I get to decide for myself what truth is now. It feels a little double-sided to me. Elder Pingree starts out this talk with a story I didn't particularly resonate with, but you had an interesting observation on it. I actually read his story about being a mission president, memorizing all the missionaries' names, and his nine-year-old son starts calling the elders and sisters by their first name, which, side note, if you look in member tools, you actually can do the same thing in your ward. I didn't really understand at first his, that relevance of that story to the topic, but you had an interesting observation on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I, I liked the story. At first, it didn't, I didn't seem to make the connection. I read it again later and, and made a little more sense to me that it seems, it seems a much more powerful way of going about saying our perception is that it's incomplete and that we're still learning and we need to see more context. And that feels, that feels much more accurate than saying, I have my own truth. And, and so for me, that, that felt like he was invoking that kind of feeling. It's that, that phrasing, right? It, it feels so wrong. Oh, my truth is such. Whereas it's more about my perspective. And that's much humbler. So, so to kind of summarize this example, he's, he's saying that uh, he had taught his family coming into the mission field or, or had gone over with them all the names of the missionaries, they had memorized faces and names and such. And his son started calling the, the, the elders and sisters by their first names. He, he gently conversed with his son about, okay, actually, this is why we need to do it a little bit differently and use that as an example to show that sometimes our understanding is incomplete. I appreciate that perspective much more than saying, oh, I'm just allowed to do my own thing and to call it my own way because my truth is my truth. And you just have to deal with that. We live in a society where it's not comfortable to critique anybody anymore, and oftentimes we're not allowed to based on societal pressures. And how sad is that, Matthew, that, what, we can't be wrong anymore? And if we can't be wrong anymore, that means we can't be right anymore. It means we can't grow anymore. It's like... Careful, you're starting to sound like Second Nephi here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the whole foundation of, of reality starts crumbling at that point, in my mind. Well, I think that... Part of that has to do with we have so entangled our perspectives with our value, right? It's I, I teach my kids to say, "Oh yeah, I saw a bad kid at school do such and such." You say, oh, "It's not a bad kid. Good people do bad things. Smart people can have wrong ideas, and when we criticize or correct or teach truth, we're not attacking individuals. We're trying to call out deception or try and correct the record or it's, it's about the ideas, right? As Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? And yet the problem is people say, well, if you're, if you're criticizing my ideology, that is a personal attack on me now, right? It's, a, it's an aggression against me. Yeah. So in, in some ways, we've just lost the art of, of conversation, being able to debate and and converse and have a civil dialogue was was historically a, a very riveting and educational thing. And, and nowadays, it's just too personal. Uh, we, we take offense at nearly everything. It's unfortunate that we've lost a lot of that. Well, because we take a lot of these ideologies, we make them our identities, right? President Nelson in May 2022 with his identities hierarchy saying, listen, you got to remember, first, the things, you're a child of God, child of the covenant, disciple of Christ. Don't let anything displace that. Yeah, it's increasingly confusing. I think I I don't know if I don't know for a fact, you know, how how this has gone, but I would wager that 200 years ago there wasn't nearly as much information out there, you know, persuading us one way or the other what our identity should be. We get so much conflicting information. And so it's it's hard. It's hard to establish roots in those three fundamental identities, Matthew, when the world is is constantly shouting at our attention through the media as to what our identity really should be. It's a hard time. And that's exactly what Elder Pingree says here. He says, we're constantly bombarded with strong opinions, biased reporting, and incomplete data. At the same time, the volume and sources of this information are proliferating. And then he says this, and again, I, I say this every time I hear some of these words, the prophets are not prone to hyperbole. 
when they say something like never or always or something a little bit dramatic, you stand up and pay attention because they're probably not exaggerating. He said, our need to recognize truth has never been more important. Our need to recognize truth has never been more important. And our society has never been less inclined to be sympathetic to a pursuit of truth. And so that doesn't seem like a like an unrelated phenomenon there. I think those two things are are correlated. The 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 or in other words, the more society lo- loosens its grasp on truth, the more important it is for us to stand as bulwarks of that truth. The darker it is, the more the light is needed. Yeah. He goes on to talk about the nature of truth. And this is really interesting to me because he gets very theological, almost philosophical, and he touches on a, a really, really interesting concept about truth that got me on a, a fun tangent into discovering some aspects of Latter-day Saint theology. He, he talks about the Lord's relationship with truth. Speaking of truth, he says, it was not created or made, it's quoting Doctrine and Covenants, and has no end, again from Doctrine and Covenants. Truth is absolute, fixed, and immutable. In other words, truth is eternal. Everything that he uses to describe truth in these references, these are the same aspects of deity. I, I think of John, where he, where, where he talks about, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I being somewhat involved in in different academic circles or, or, or rubbing shoulders up with people that are, you know, publishing papers and college professors and, and so forth. This this is something that has really struck me recently, Matthew, because I have a lot of empathy for these kind of these academics, one that you were citing earlier even, that are so well meaning, that try so hard, that really are seeking after truth and so often are getting are getting really lost in in the minutia here and, and following these paths that are leading them toward relativism toward moral relativism or at very least like kind of a kind of a, a minimalist relative position where they're saying well the whole the whole purpose of 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 a society should be to minimize suffering but outside that one thing you can you can do and you can believe anything you want to the the paths that they take to get there like i've seen that thought process happen in people and they're trying to make logical conclusions based on the information they have. And based on a secular world with no God, I can see how they draw those conclusions. If there is no God, then yes, it makes more sense to say that nothing actually matters or that you know everybody can do their own thing and we just want to minimize suffering and, and that's good enough. But, but when you say this, Matthew, what strikes me is that truth is absolute, fixed, and immutable. It wasn't created or made. God himself did not create truth. It already existed. If you contrast those two experiences, it feels so powerful to me, right? These, these academic types that are, that are pontificating about moral relativism are someday going to wake up and they're going to feel so small, you know, and all of us are going to wake up and feel so small when we realize like, oh my goodness, there really was a truth. And our understanding was just a hair of a sliver of this ty- of this huge circle that we didn't even know what we were talking about. That's going to be a that's going to be a rude awakening, and I'm I'm excited for that personally. And I hope to have the humility to be able to accept and nurture that truth in, inside of myself. But it's kind of comical just how little we know, and so it always makes me chuckle when these when these academic types that you're talking about can be so certain about their position. Well, what are they certain about? They're certain about deconstructing what we know, right? That's, as I've also talked with various people who ascribe this philosophy, they approach everything that society thinks it knows with such a degree of skepticism that their bias is to tear it down by default, right? To, to find a way to invalidate it and leave you in this miasma of confusion because there's where true intellectual progress can be made. My wife and I just read through The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. What a fantastic book. And one piece that really stuck out to me as I was considering this, this talk here was the preacher, the heretical preacher in the story, who he, he's, he's at the verge of heaven, right? He's talking with one of his fellow preachers, and he, he hates the idea of you come in heaven and you don't have to seek anymore because you, you seek to learn, and then you learn, and then you know, and you don't have to seek anymore. He's like, but if I'm not seeking anymore, like, what's the purpose? 
there's so many questions and you have to, yeah, but we got to answer this. Yeah, but it's the fun of basically teasing apart the questions and proposing alternate theories. And he says, for example, I'm, I, before I died, I was writing a paper to try and, you know, talk about how maybe the resurrection is just symbolic and it's not historically accurate or what might Jesus have taught if he just survived a little longer and what his teachings would have been different given the experience of life. And he's just going on to what we would call very much blasphemy, but he's so attached to this idea of deny the known so that you can theorize into the unknown. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. At which point, you're pre- you're, it almost seems like you're placing a lesser value on the concept and worth of truth as a thing in and of itself at that point. It's the investigation that's fun, yeah. And you, you attach so much to the journey, you don't ever want to arrive. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. I, I would wonder if even more fun than the investigation itself would be the application of truth. If you have truth accessible to you in, 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 that, in that unfiltered and perfect way, I, I, I wonder what you could do with that. And, and, and yes, we could, get, we could get very deep into speculative doctrine here, and that's obviously not the point. But I'm in awe of wondering how incredible it will be to be able to see, not through a glass darkly, but face to face. Well, I think Elder, Elder Pingree actually answers that question, where in his next section, he talks about God reveals eternal truth. He says, God is the source of eternal truth. He and his son, Jesus Christ, have a perfect understanding of truth and always act in harmony with true principles and laws. This power allows them to create and govern worlds, as well as to love, guide, and nurture each one of us perfectly. And so this is really interesting because I, I read that. I had heard other Latter-day Saints at, at some point tell me, oh, well, good is whatever God says. If God says to do something, then it's therefore, therefore it's good. And I, I always felt kind of a little unsettled with that way of phrasing it, because I'm like, well, is that just like the might makes right argument taken to a, a divine degree, right? Mm, yeah, interesting. And, and that kind of gives space for the idea of, well, if I don't like what God says about a law, maybe, you know, that's just the way that God happened to decide it's going to be, and it doesn't actually have any true objective moral weight to it. But what Elder Pingree seems to be saying, and what I've heard other church leaders say pretty consistently in, in, in recent decades is that God is God. He he doesn't just author the laws of truth. He reveals them and obeys them himself. He shows us the perfect example of how to conform to eternal truth. Yeah, and is very generous about them as well. Matthew, I, I, I like what you're citing here because he also says it's a network of relationships, a network of revelatory relationships, you know, and so he's very generous with saying, hey, these are things that have been revealed. These are established. I want you to participate in them as well. And there is no cost for that. Come and buy milk and honey without money and without price. And what a wonderful blessing that is that, you know, he, he conforms his life to divine truth. And now he invites us to do the same and enjoy every blessing that he does. I mean, that's just such a fantastic, for all of the talk that people have about the exclusivity and the judgment of the church, there is no theology more inclusive than that of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wow, what a fantastic point. I like that, Matthew. Yeah, I think it's Elder Christofferson that originally said that. I don't remember. It, I'll, I'll just attribute it to you and I'll just get away with that. <laughs> no, I'm in big trouble. And of course, he talks about prophets and apostles and scriptures being official channels through which we receive truth. And I, I would note here, this talk, in this section of the talk here, talking about official channels, pairs very well with two particular general conference talks that I want to link out here. The first one is from 2010, President Oak's fantastic talk, Two Lines of Communication. And then the other is Elder Dale G. Renlund's talk, A Framework for Personal Revelation. And that's just from 2022, so fairly recent. But both of those are absolutely solid and very well in line with what Elder Pingree is sharing here. Something that comes to mind, Matthew, as as you're talking about... uh about these official channels of truth and and how exclusive it may feel to some, but how inclusive it really is. Some things that I've heard fairly often, I would say, are these ideas of like, okay, the church is telling us to receive this personal revelation that it's this two-way street as you're describing. And yet, if it doesn't line up with revealed principles, then it must not have been revelation. 
And so I get this complaint often of like, okay, so the church says I can receive revelation, but only if it matches what they say. And so they're still controlling truth and they can get pretty bitter about what they feel is like a biased perspective there. Leading the witness, right? That's a good way of saying that. I I think that's unfortunate. I I find that unfortunate. I I think of my own children and and I certainly don't know everything, but I I have a nine month old. And, you know, if, if she were if she's exploring the world around her, she's she's learning and she's growing, she's making mistakes and she's figuring things out. And I'm excited to be there beside her to help guide her into understanding the world that I've come to know through my own experiences and mistakes too. And so I'm so excited for her to understand more. And I see a much bigger perspective than she does. If she made the same argument, as it were, of saying, you know, I'm I'm going to insist on being wrong because I just want to spite you. That would feel really hurtful to me because it's not the point. The point is not about like saying, "Hey, who's right and who's wrong here," and and having that that kind of conflict or you know whatever you want to call that. The point is to say, "Hey, I have a relationship with you. I have something amazing. Do you want to be a part of it or not?" If there is value in the church, Matthew, if this is the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, then I think it's fair to say there is an incredible value here beyond any kind of price you could ever establish. If that's the truth, imagine how incredible that would be to be a part of that through these network of revelatory relationships. And if it's not the truth, then okay, people can go on their own way and decide not to be a part of it. And we give them that space and we give them that freedom. But that's where that argument falls apart for me is to say, we have incredible truth. Seek revelation and see if you find it. And if not, we will not force you. We will not obligate you. We will still try to love you. And of course, some members of the church do better than others in in that respect. But what an invitation that really is. And, And that's why it's worth it to try to seek out these eternal truths through the influence of the Holy Ghost. As as I believe he he goes on to to talk about in this talk, yeah, there are, there are limits to that. As Elder Renlon said, we, we, he said just like pilots landing at an airport, you, you got to stay in your runway to avoid collisions. And so we are not given the mantle of revealing new doctrines to the church, right, or of declaring the doctrine of Christ in any official capacity. We are given the blessing of receiving a spiritual witness of those doctrines and of what the prophets have said. And I've heard many people complain, well, if, if all I'm good for is to receive confirmation of what someone else said, that, is that really revelation? Like I said, is, is that leading the witness? What about my, my personal authority is a big, a big term going around right now on the socials of people saying, oh, I claim my personal authority to counter the prophet. You know, where, where does personal revelation fit in with that when it counters what the official channels are saying? And I really love what Elder Pingree says to answer that question very nicely. He worded this very well. He was very cautious and careful and gentle about this. He said, our ability to receive and apply truth is dependent on the strength of our relationship with the Father and the Son, our responsiveness to the influence of the Holy Ghost, and our alignment with Latter-day Prophets. As a math nerd, I love thinking in mathematical terms. And what this says is there is a correlation here. Inasmuch as you grow in your testimony, and you are zealously faithful to the Lord and to his servants, that increases your ability to receive revelation. If you are coming at it predisposed against the Lord and his servants, against the doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you are not going to receive personal revelation nearly as consistently or as clearly as if you were in alignment with the Lord and his church. Again, to bring in President Oak's talk from 2010, He said, there are many people who go off the rails and claim that they had inspiration from God to do so. 2022, Elder Renlund talked about a guy who was trying to dig up scriptures in someone else's basement. I know a a gentleman I had a conversation with that said God told him it was okay for him to marry another man, despite the counsel of, you know, a sick president, the church, and everything. President Oaks concludes that concept saying, such individuals may be receiving revelation, but it is not from the source that they suppose. We have to be very careful. If we are not in alignment with the Lord and his prophets, then our trust and our personal revelation goes out the window. This is a sticky point, Matthew. This is, I love that we are discussing this, but this, this is so crucial and so critical in so many ways. And it's not easy. I don't, I don't think that it's easy or necessarily intuitive for, 
for many of us to parse that out, to discern, because all of us experience thoughts, all of us have complicated feelings, to come to know and differentiate between what is the spirit and what is not. I think it requires a lot of practice. I don't recall who had talked about that. That's ringing a bell somewhere that this is kind of a process here. It's a process of of prayer and revelation and, and a little bit of trial and error. And as we prayerfully and humbly seek that out, my opinion is that we can get better at at, at recognizing those those voices better. But I think it's I think it's fair to say we're going to make some mistakes as we go along to say or to claim that some personal thoughts may have been revelation. And perhaps as as you're saying, there are members of the church that are claiming revelation when maybe their relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is not not where it's at yet or where 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 it could be. It's not at that level of strength. We don't need to criticize or judge them for that. It's just that we need to be clear and and have a clear understanding of the truth of what's happening here. I mean, you're talking about some of these other experiences that that you've had. I've personally met Jesus six times at the Utah State Hospital. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, people people are absolutely 100% convinced that they are he, they are him. Are they? Well, I would would submit to you, Matthew, that they are not, you know, (laughs) in the simple fact of the math alone, right? So it's delicate. That's really def- delicate. I want to have empathy for people that are trying to find revelation and truth, but are mislabeling. That's a that's a tough process, I think. Well, and that's why the Lord gives us guardrails, right? So that we can learn before we start to veer off too far when we're starting to enter dangerous waters. I, I And I like to think that the Lord gives us a lot of grace in that. Right, if you ask priesthood holders when they give a blessing, even if they're perfectly aligned with the brethren and the doctrines and the prophets, there's some of your own opinion and your own wording and you know your own influence that's going to creep into blessings. The promise is that God's not going to let you get so far astray if you're aligned on the important stuff. So going on to the next section, he says there are two key indicators that we can tell when we're recognizing eternal truth. And again, he says, whether concept comes from God or from another source, and of course we know who that source would be, is, is that concept taught consistently in the scriptures and by the living prophets? And is the concept confirmed by the witness of the Holy Ghost? That's it. Nice and easy, (laughs) right? Supposedly. Yeah, and sometimes things are the most beautiful because they are so simple. You know, if, if you were to ask some sort of epistemologist, Matthew, you know, what what are the sources or, or metrics by which you can establish the truth of some claim? I imagine the list would be significantly longer than two bullet point items. <laughs> and and there's there's definitely a part of me that loves that that banter, as as you described from C.S. Lewis's book, the the seeking. You got me, Matthew. That's something that's something that I can relate to. It's not it's nice to or to, to try to have the humility. I think is refreshing to say, you know what? Two points. Okay. I can get behind that. Yep. And then he makes a promise, which is really fantastic. Now, I I love hearing the promises of the prophets and the apostles and the general authorities, but I love it even more when it is specific and powerful. And he says, over time, as we consistently live the principle, we gain a sure knowledge of that truth. When's the last time you thought about having a sure knowledge? It's almost like we talk about faith so frequently, and it is such an, an important principle that we don't realize the blessings that are ours for the taking if we put in the effort. Yeah, to play devil's advocate a little bit here, Matthew, and I hope this resonates with some people. You can correct me when I steer away, Matthew, but it doesn't tricky for me, if I'm honest, because sure, I think I've had these experiences, and I know others have claimed to have these experiences, where there are moments of time when we receive a revelatory experience, and we have, at least at that moment, this influence of the Spirit working us, and we know that something is true. How beautiful that is. If there are people out there, members of the church that haven't had that, I, I feel for them and, and hope that they don't give up in, in trying to experience that witness of whatever it may be, the Book of Mormon or of any other principle of the gospel. For me personally, Matthew, it feels like that moment is special, but it's not as if that feeling of knowledge and light persists indefinitely. It seems to wax and wane. And so when we bear our testimonies, at least when I bear my testimony, it's almost like saying, I recall this experience and I knew that that was true in that moment. 
and I'm continuing to trust that. And, and for me, that feels like faith. For me, that feels like faith to say, I had a revelatory experience that I trust. And I'm continuing to trust that. And when life gets hard and when life appears darker, I'm still going to trust that, even though I, I don't necessarily feel that level of excitement and, and euphoria or whatever you want to call it. Now, it's something that we have to hold on to because we're, we're still in this world, at least for this time being. I 100% resonate to that, right? I, I think of, and I've brought this up in pre- previous episodes before, Mother Teresa went 50 years where she felt like the heavens were brass that God was not answering her prayers, and it would have been very easy to doubt the powerful spiritual experiences she had had earlier in her life, right? Alma's big question, can you feel so now? Sometimes we don't really feel it. But as Elder Anderson teaches, faith is not by chance, but by choice. It's more than a feeling, it's a decision. He talks in another talk about spiritually defining memories, like you said, bring those up, look back on them from when it was clear. But then, to devil's advocate, your devil's advocate. <laughs> If you say you used to know something, but now you don't feel as sure, does that mean that you ever knew it? Or does it mean that you believed it, had faith in it, but hadn't quite received the sure knowledge that Elder Pinkery is talking about? Yeah. See, for me, I, I, I believe the church is true. I have faith that the church is true. I have faith in this gospel enough to stake the life of myself and that of my family and everything I have on earth on that principle. That's, that's where I'm at. But I would still call it faith. I wouldn't call it a sure knowledge yet. And then here's Elder Pingree saying, look, over time, eventually, maybe not even in this life, but eventually, that sure knowledge is within the grasp. We don't always have to be seeking. We don't always have to be, like, don't look at faith as if that's the end goal. The end goal is perfect knowledge, and that promise is that we will all eventually have that someday. And I think sometimes, again, going back to the blasphemous preacher from C.S. Lewis, we enjoy the struggle so much, or we get so at least accustomed to it, that we forget that that's out there, and that that's a, an eventual possibility, and even going to be a reality for everyone eventually. I, I like this word trust that you're using, Matthew. This this is relevant in so many ways for me. I I I work a lot with people that are, are experiencing difficulties, including anxiety, and, and anxiety comes to mind here because a lot of individuals that are dealing with anxiety, it's almost as if they're looking ahead to the future and and even parsing through the past. And they just feel this incredible weight of hundreds of things that are going to happen and have happened. They're taking on all that weight at once. And that's so hard for them. And and this idea of truth is pretty relevant psychologically. The, the, the psychological version of this, Matthew, is mindfulness. Mindfulness, in other words, is trusting yourself right here and right now. Maybe you don't have to carry on all the burden of hundreds of things that are going to happen tomorrow. Maybe you stay present and you say, I'm going to trust my knowledge. I'm going to trust myself. I'm going to trust my experiences in the gospel sense. I'm going to trust God, if you want to add that, to be able to handle things one step at a time. That process of disciplining the mind to mindfully step one stepping stone at a time through life is psychologically very healthy, right? And so you're talking about this from a gospel perspective and and how cool is that, that these principles align? I was say, truth resonates with truth, right? Sure does. Regardless of the specific focus, right? So he goes on to a big question that many members of the church now may be wrestling with, which is, what should we do when we sincerely seek for truth not yet revealed? Now, I think some members may be saying, well, stop seeking for it, right? <laughs> Problem solved. But it, it seems a, a given that he says, no, we should be wrestling. We should be asking questions. We should be trying to call down knowledge from heaven and grow in our progress. Too often we develop this primary understanding, this primary level understanding of the gospel, which is beautiful, which is wonderful, which is simple and sacred and just so valuable. But then we're just content to stay there. And it's like, "Eh, God's got more in mind for us. As President Nelson said, in a coming day, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding constant directing influence of the Holy Ghost. He says, you need to learn to receive revelation. And then he even quotes this amazing Neil A. Maxwell quote that says, to those who are seeking, Heavenly Father is ready to reveal the secrets of the universe. What amazing blessings it is. First of all, you should be asking questions. Now let's answer the concern of what to do when the questions 
aren't answered. I I think maybe some tendency of members of the church, I wonder, is if we seek for something that maybe we're not supposed to know yet, or the knowledge is, it's not time yet for that knowledge, and we don't get an answer. And so we desist, we desist and say, oh, my bad. Oh, I must have been wrong. I'm sorry. And I wonder if we can be timid about that. And Matthew, some of what you're saying makes me wonder or think, well, what if that's not what if that's not the intention to say we should just cease and desist? What if it's more like that parable in in the Bible, is it Luke maybe, where there was a judge, and there there was a widow that kept troubling this judge because he, she cried day and night unto that judge. Eventually, the judge relented and said, "Okay, because of your faith, essentially, I'm going to give you this knowledge that you're seeking." So what if what if the silence is not necessarily a sign that we were wrong for asking? What if the silence is instead a trial of faith and we should keep persisting to show that we want it enough? I forget whether it was Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, one of those famous Greek philosophers. Supposedly, the, the story goes, a young man came to him and said, I want to know everything, you know, I want wisdom. And he said, oh, you do. Do you come with me to the river? And he's like, okay, cool. He's going to teach me. And he takes this young man and shoves him under the water until he's about to die yanks him up, back up, he gasps for breath, down he goes again, does this several times and finally lets him out. And the guy said, what's wrong with you, you crazy? And he said, when you desire wisdom as much as you desired air, then come back and we'll talk. That's something that I'm starting to learn in my own personal studies as well. I really appreciated Elder Pingree's footnote number 31. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he gives this potential answer to the question of why we haven't received knowledge. He said, I do not know all the reasons that God withholds some eternal truths from us. But Elder Orson F. Whitney provided an interesting insight, quote, It is blessed to believe without seeing, since by the exercise of faith comes spiritual development. One of the great objects of man's earthly existence, while knowledge, by swallowing up faith, prevents its exercise, thus hindering our development. Knowledge is power, and all things are known in due season, but premature knowledge, knowing at the wrong time, is fatal both to progress and to happiness. There was a time, I don't want to get too personal, but I was praying about a, a question and I wanted to know. I didn't want to just believe. I didn't want to just have faith. I wanted to know. And I received a prompting and the prompting was, are you sure about that? <laughs> Basically, to people who receive knowledge of things, God holds them to a very high standard to act in accordance with that knowledge. Are you ready for that level of accountability? And when you are faced with that kind of question from God, it gives you pause, as it should. God wants us to take the study of the gospel seriously. Look at Moroni, when he talks about seeking for a revelation of the Book of Mormon, which we promise every investigator, right? You pray, you will know. Well, it's more nuanced than that. If you pray with real intent, it means to intend to act on the answer we receive. I remember one time I went to my dad, and I said, hey, dad, what's your social security number? And he laughed. He says, <laughs> that is a very good and interesting question, but I need to know what in the world you're going to do with that information. And I said, oh, you know, just, you know, I'm a teenager. I don't want to tell you too much about my, my life. He said, well, you're going to have to tell me what's going on, because if there's a Nigerian prince who's interested in this question, I, that, that's going to be a no from me. And I said, well, actually, I'm opening up a savings account at the bank, and I'm going to start saving some money for my journey. He said, oh, so that, that's a good thing to do with that information. And now that I know what you intend to do with this answer, I'm willing to give it to you. We have to be careful that sometimes we're seeking knowledge out of curiosity. Sometimes we're seeking knowledge for the wrong reasons, and we need to make sure that we are going in there with the full, the full-throated, just not holding back intent to actually act in accordance to it if we get it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and 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 you, and as you as you read, knowledge is power. And if we're if we're receiving and, and experiencing the power of God, then there's a lot of responsibility. Now I'm sounding like Spider Man, but <laughs> and this is interesting that you mentioned this. My wife and I were just talking about this the other day, and, and my wife said something to the effect of, "Imagine what the world would be like if every human alive today had superhuman power, right? Or if they had godly power, wouldn't that be a frightening thought?" This is fair, I think, Matthew, that there's some gatekeeping here on Heavenly Father's part, and when we crave that air badly enough and have the right intentions, it's remarkable to me that we can gain knowledge by study and also by faith. And there's a reason for that. I mean, you, you look at how Jesus wrapped his teachings in parables and his disciples got 
for the first of all, the Pharisees were frustrated. They're like, tell us plainly you know, what's going on here. And then the disciples are like, hey, why are you speaking to them in parables? Like, you're playing with us. Why not do that with the crowd? And he said basically to the effect of like, like, that is a benefit for you guys, but they are not ready for that yet. And with parables, he's wrapping it in so many layers of meaning that only those who are honestly, truly seeking are going to get out the powerful message that he's trying to convey. And I used to think that that's kind of being a little jerkish. I would have been like the parable, the Pharisee telling, saying, tell me plainly. But then I realized that is an act of mercy. He's basically saying, I am withholding that level of accountability that you are clearly not ready for yet and would just heap condemnation on your soul. So I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a child lock on, on this particular thing. <laughs> That's an interesting way of seeing it. I like that. I'm going to quote you on that. And then he goes on to talk about the differences between doctrine and policy. And I resonate very strongly for this. I wrote a whole paper for the Interpreter Journal on this subject because this is one of the biggest confusions I see in the church on both sides, by the way. This is, this is a huge thing. So I want to spend a bit of time in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts, Matthew. I haven't, I haven't seen your article on this. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to learn something from you. It does feel like, like a sticking point for a lot of members of the church. I, f- I felt like he approached this very simply. Uh, what, what was his definition? He remind me that uh, doctrine is the application of eternal truth. Or, or tell me, tell me again what that was. He said doctrine refers to eternal truths, such as the nature of the Godhead, the plan of salvation, and Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice. On the other hand, policy is the application of doctrine based on current circumstances. Right. So he goes on to say, while doctrine never changes, policy adjusts from time to time. Now, I have seen this bite people so much. And part of it is our own fault. I say our meaning church members' own fault going back for centuries. Unfortunately, earlier church leaders use the word doctrine a lot more loosely than modern church leaders do. And that's not you know, necessarily on them. It's, it's, it comes down to two things. So Alma, when he teaches, he's very clear to disambiguate between his opinion and the doctrine. He says, I give it my opinion that there's more than one resurrection and, and all this other stuff, right? Paul also does the same thing in his epistles as a reading, come follow me, where he's like, hey, th- this is my idea. Here's some counsel, but this is not a revelation on this, on this subject. Not all church leaders have been quite so, you know, clearly delineating when they're speaking as a prophet, when they're not speaking as a prophet. And furthermore, the word doctrine has changed over time. It used to just mean teaching, and it didn't evolve into this this sort of very uh, uh, solidified view that we currently use it in its word. And so the problem happens when people go and read something in journal discourses, or they hear you know something that someone said before they were called as apostle, or whatever the case may be, that does not resonate with doctrine as we understand it, as revealed by prophets, seers, and revelators, especially on issues like race and the priesthood and stuff. And all of a sudden, they realize, people who read this, they come to an impasse with their current understanding of the truth. It's very easy if you just go with a very primary song understanding of revelation and prophetic fallibility and doctrine and all this stuff to come away with the understanding, as I certainly did as a kid, that anything any prophet has ever said is the mind and will of the Lord itself, right? And then you come into stuff where there's contradiction stuff, you're like, okay, my understanding, my framework that I'd built my foundation on was brittle. And there's two ways that you can do, the two ways that you can go about changing that. One way is to basically make it even more solidly brittle. And then, you know, you end up, you end up breaking your testimony because things change. And if you say everything's a doctrine, then, and everything's unchangeable, then you lose your testimony when they get rid of scouting right? Or when the three-hour church switches to two-hour church, or there's a new version of, of the Fourth Strength Youth pamphlet or something. And we, we see a few cases of that. The more common response that I see is what I call the ultimate flexibility, the ultimate nuance view, which is, okay, there is no doctrine, or if there are doctrines, it's like two of them, like Jesus and God, and that's the doctrine. And everything else has a big old asterisk next to it, subject to change. And there's some that tout this as like an expansive view of the restoration, where everything, even very critical elements of the plan of salvation, are just maybe. They all represent just the interpretations of men, or this is our limited understanding of what we have so far, but we may find out this is completely the opposite. And then they start to hope, not in Christ, but hope for changes in policies, because policies and doctrines 
they're just the same thing and swap them in and out. But he's clear to say, listen, the doctrines are firm, immutable. Doctrine never changes, whereas policy adjusts from time to time. And the ability to sort things out into those two different buckets is absolutely critical to not feel like you're blindsided when something you didn't expect to change does change, or to start entertaining ideas that things that can't change would. I, I don't I don't blame people who who struggle with this line. This this is this is hard and confusing. And and, and I think this I think we would do really well, Matthew, to to understand that line much more clearly and to and to really rely on the doctrine and accept the policy. I, I would I would submit that to me it feels like okay, there's the doctrine and then there's the policy, and then there's local best efforts of application of the policy. <laughs> We were just in Michigan for for a vacation and, and had the wonderful opportunity of experiencing some church experiences there. We were attending a beautiful branch. It was so refreshing to me. I absolutely loved my experience there. There were, there were like 15 of us in, in this small building and looking out over, over the lake. And the faith of those members felt genuine and sincere. But if I can't put my finger on it exactly why why it felt different, but there are there are differences in administration of the church at the local level, the grassroots level. Here, where I'm living in Utah Valley versus Michigan versus my experiences teaching the gospel in Argentina versus chances that I had to go to like Honduras, for example. There, there were very very significant differences in how things felt. And so, I think looking at this talk, he goes on to talk about this, right? That Unfortunately, we sometimes confuse policy with doctrine, and if we do not understand the difference, we risk becoming disillusioned when policies change and may even begin to question God's wisdom or the revelatory role of prophets. And so when we're talking about like a like an official policy change, that is difficult. Maybe Matthew, you can comment more on that in a moment, but I'm talking more about even even things that are just individual differences between local administration, that feels really hard for a lot of people. So this strengthens your point in my mind that you were making about how it's important to be able to see clearly what's going on and have your faith in Christ and in the doctrine that he taught and to see the policy and the local efforts at applying policy in the right context. The model that I like to use for what I would say is a healthy framework for differentiating these things is a tree. A tree that can weather a storm, its trunk is rigid. It is solid. And ultimately, if you, if you hurt the trunk, the tree is dead, right? That is the critical juncture. But then the branches themselves are very flexible, right? And can even be removed or lopped off or pruned as needed. And it doesn't harm the overall health of the tree too much. So it's this mixture of solidity at the core on the doctrinal level and flexibility on the periphery at the branches level that we, we need to develop. An overly rigid tree is not going to survive a storm. And an ultimately flexible tree is just going to bend over and get muddy and, and have problems with every sort of storm of social pressure that comes along. What about the whomping willow? The whomping willow. <laughs> That's the aggressive apologetics right there. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. That's, yeah, I'm a bit of a whomping willow myself, but I'm not holding that out as who you should be. <laughs> <laughs> And then he goes on to talk, speaking of apologetics, don't be a whomping willow. He talks about teaching eternal truth. And he has another, this is footnote 36. He talks about invitations from the Lord's was prophets. And I want to call this out, footnote 36. He says, our aim is to teach truth in a way that invites the converting power of the Holy Ghost. And then he shares some simple invitations from the Lord and his prophets that can help. And he gives seven specific invitations. Before we talk about the invitations, this comes from a document that I w that was given out at some state conferences and stuff. This is actually an approved document from the first president of the Quorum 12. If you haven't seen it yet, you probably will at your next state conference. The document's entitled Principles for Ensuring Doctrinal Purity. And the short version is this. The first presidency in Quorum of the 12 are sick of hearing people get up for Come Follow Me and just rehearsing a podcast or talking about some Instagram post that they saw someone make. And then going off into the weeds, going off and interjecting philosophies of men and mingling them with scripture and not sticking to the manual that was provided. This is a huge thing that I have certainly seen in, in the English speaking words. I, I've, I've been participating in the past few years. I'm in a Spanish branch now, so we don't quite have that same, that same experience. Like you said, cultural differences between the, the units. 
But it's it's really interesting to me. The first presidency in Quorum Twelve are really pushing hard on this, and and we can dive here into his his seven seven recommendations. Okay, so taking taking a look at these these recommendations, I, I would have to say that number four is especially hard for me, Matthew. Avoiding speculation, personal opinions, or worldly ideas. So maybe you can help me out a little here, Matthew. Too. At what point is it speculation and personal opinion? that we're declaring is fact and other people need to get on board. And at one point, at what point are we making our best efforts to internalize and to understand in our own language what is being taught? So his footnote is really enlightening on that point, I think. Um, he shares a great quote about President, from President Dallin H. Oaks. He said, There are some who select a few sentences from the teachings of a prophet and use these to support their political agenda or other personal purposes. To wrest the words of a prophet to support a private agenda, political or financial or otherwise, is to try to manipulate the prophet, not to follow him. That's powerful. I, I've seen this so often. I've been guilty of this at times too, where you can pick a phrase from President Benson and pick a phrase from Elder McConkie and pick like four different sources. And soon you have this tiny little chorus that when taken out of context from these very particular sources seem to be saying exactly what you want them to say. Whereas what the brethren are clear as is, is it's the consensus of the standard works and all the prophets and apostles that declare the doctrine. Right. That's good. That's, and that's what I was thinking too. The next point, number five is teach a point of doctrine within the context of related gospel truths. I think if you are trying to find your way in understanding a gospel doctrine as it relates to yourself, then stacked side by side with other related gospel truths, it will start to become much more clear instead of just uh, promoting a personal agenda. One interesting thing that I thought was very powerful, point number one, I know we jumped over that. He said, center on Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and their fundamental doctrine. And he gives this great quote from Elder Anderson, who says, let us focus on the Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of his atoning sacrifice. This doesn't mean we cannot tell and experience from our own life or share thoughts from others. While our subject might be about families or service or temples or a recent mission, everything should point to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a, a great, actually he was a U.S. judge and stake president in various church callings, Thomas Griffith, who wrote an article in the Ensign that really hit me powerfully. He spoke about when he was a stake president in a, it was a young adult ward out at BYU, I believe, that he and his counselors felt impressed to instruct bishops saying every lesson in every class and every sacrament meeting talk needs to be about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now that sounds a little heavy handed. What he said was, if you're going to talk about tithing, which is a true principle, talk about tithing and how it relates to the atonement of Jesus Christ. If you're going to talk about eternal families and temple work, Make sure to include how that relates to the atonement of Jesus Christ. The atonement of Jesus Christ enables us. He says, everything that we teach should be able to be tied directly back to the atonement of Jesus Christ. And if it cannot in the church of Jesus Christ, then maybe we should not be spending time in sacrament meeting talking about it. That should be a fireside. That should be a joint family home evening. That should be in some other forum. But in our most sacred meeting in the church, the sacrament meetings, and in our Sunday schools, we should be focused on the Savior as the root as the source of all these different principles we talk about. Everything from emergency preparedness onwards. Interesting. No, that's good. I've heard complaints in the past about how how boring that may seem. You know, some people, I've heard this criticism, yeah, that, okay, well, that's boring. If we're just talking about the basics and if we're talking about these points of doctrine, and it feels to some people, I think, very limiting. And, and there's that quote, I, don't, I, don't, I can't recall who that's from, who said that preach, preach the gospel some yeah, I don't I forgive me. Some some preach the gospel quote where it's talking about the first four principles and ordinance of the gospel. You teach those, you teach Jesus Christ, you teach faith, and everything else is 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 just, you know, an appendage to that. Maybe I'm conflating two quotes here. But but the point is you can get really stuck on on these basics. And some people can think, okay, that's just narrow minded. I, I would counter that. Something that I've thought about before is, okay, well, with that simplicity, that's what's accessing the power. We're not talking about like vast theoretical knowledge saving us. We're talking about what really matters. And we're talking about accessing the power of this incredible, supernal, eternal being. 
So in that lens, it makes a little more sense to me that, again, back to your C.S. Lewis idea that if there really is this much power in the gospel, then we do need to stay trained on it because that is what matters. We're allowed to have gospel hobbies in a sense, right? We all have subjects that we feel so passionate about. For me, it's always been missionary work. I remember being assigned to speak. You know, they had a, a speaker drop out the last second on my mission, and the bishop says, hey, we would like you to speak on faith. I said, the faith defined. Sounds like a great topic, Bishop. He says, no, just, just faith. <laughs> but the problem is when we take these things that we're passionate about in the gospel, and it overpowers and it dominates. Jesus says he's the true vine, and every branch that is not connected to the true vine is cut off. The power that we see in all these peripheral aspects of the gospel lose their power when they are not connected to the fundamentals. And then towards the end here, Elder Pingree moves on to a section he titles Speaking Truth in Love. And this is the part where, you know, Whomping Willow Matthew gets a bit of a guilt trip here. <laughs> but I know that you're really good at this. I'm going to let you start covering it. <laughs> this was actually my favorite part of the talk. So I'm, I appreciate the deference there, Matthew. This is something that I certainly can do better on too. This, this, part was what struck me the most. And it was actually at this moment that I said, you know what, Matthew, I really want to talk about this with you. Truth taught without love, he says, can cause feelings of judgment, discouragement, and loneliness. It can often lead to resentment and division, even conflict. On the other hand, love without truth is hollow and lacks the promise of growth. When I was thinking about this and talking about this with my wife afterward, the way that I summarized this without remembering exactly the words he said, was that truth, truth taught without love is harsh and love without truth is hollow. That, that's, that's, those are my words. That's my summary. But truth is truth and truth is so wonderful and truth taught harshly, well, maybe in a very humble environment could still lead somebody to find Christ. But when you put those two things together, you have substance and you have, and you have this invitation that really resonates with people, that strikes a chord with them, because everybody is going through something extremely hard in their life. I really appreciate that perspective of Elder Eyring when he was talking about how many people are experiencing suffering. And if you kind of approach people with that love in your heart, understanding that they may be going through some serious difficulty, it'll change your perspective with them. Contrary-wise, the opposite is more often true, I think, in our society today, Matthew. This is, this is what hurts my heart a lot. I hear a lot of people trying to love others without truth, trying to love others completely and openly and empathetically, and also permitting them to make egregious mistakes that will hurt them and cripple them later on in life without commenting in the spirit of love and of saying, I respect any and every decision you could ever make because I love you. At what point can we stand up and say, there is actually truth here, and because I love you, let me provide some perspective as I see things. We're in a position where we feel like that's too delicate. We feel like that's too complicated, you know? And that's not the kind of parent I want to be. I want to be the kind of parent who can say, hey, look at this perspective that I have. Look at my experiences and let, I want you to hear from what I have to say. Even, even if that's not what you think or believe, I owe it to my children to say, hey, let's look at this from a different perspective before you do something that you're going to regret. I hope that I can do that as my children grow with an abundance of love so that they can receive it because the combination of those two things is quite powerful. And I will add for other whomping willows like me, the injunction to speak the truth of love is not just a best practice. It is a commandment from God. One of the most impactful scriptures of my mission, Doctrine and Covenants 50 verses 17, he asks missionaries, do you preach the word of truth by the comforter? In the spirit of truth? Do you preach by the spirit of truth or by some other way? And if it be by some other way, it is not of God. Later on, he goes on to say, if you receive, the, if you receive not the spirit, ye shall not teach. As teachers in the gospel, we're tasked with far more than just throwing information at people. I give training in, the, in a district meeting on my mission. I, I had a whole bunch of rocks, and we'd written in Sharpie on it, fact. And I just walked to each elder in the mission, and I just gave them typical Bible bash stuff. Like, oh, well, there's Casmus in the Book of Mormon. Threw a rock at him, gently. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, you know, the, it could be the, the, need, the, the horses of the Book of Mormon explain this way. Here's this. Oh, you know, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon 65 working days? No other author has ever done that fact. You know, toss them all. And then and that, that, was, that was fun. It was interesting, right? And my companion came by with 100 grand bars, my favorite candy bar at least. 
And on the Sharpie, we'd written truth. And he handed one saying, I know the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I know that the church is guided by a prophet of God. And he just bore testimony one after the other. And the spirit was palpably different. It was exactly the effect we wanted to go for. The difference between fact and truth, it has to be communicated in the right way, or it's not worth communicating at all. And as you point out the reverse, where you say love without truth is hollow, I would even go a step farther. Love without truth isn't love at all. There's a meme where someone's drowning and their, their hand's coming up, and then you just see another hand come down and give them a high five. <laughs> That's not what they need right now. They, they, they need something a little bit more substantial. And if we don't offer that substantial thing that will serve their eternal benefit and their eternal interests, we're not really loving them. I've had some experiences hiking that seem interesting. One guy comes to mind as, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the medical condition is called, but some state of hypoxia, maybe high elevation altitude sickness and being very disoriented and confused. If you, if you are confused and, and lost, as I remember one guy being, and, and resisting medical treatment, at what point do you say, well, that's too bad. Here's your medical treatment. And this is an ethical question in, in medicine, to be sure. And there are lines there. There are interventions. As a society, we still fortunately have these lines where we're willing to say, you don't know what's best for yourself right now. We're going to hospitalize you against your will. Involuntary commitment. That seems really harsh. And you can really, you can really fight against that. And, and, I, and I've seen this many times, not, not necessarily with, with medicine, but in other, in other ways. I've also seen them come out on the other side where they say, you know what, this was the very best thing I needed for myself, even though I couldn't see clearly at the time. Elder Hubie Brown's amazing talk about the current bush comes to mind, where he says, we need to be humble enough to look back across the years and say, thank you, God, for loving me enough to hurt me. Now, if our Heavenly Father loves us enough to hurt us, right, give us temporary discomfort or pain for an eternal benefit that we can't yet see, the loving thing as friends, as family, may be to do exactly that. Now, of course, we never seek, as Elder Klebingott says, I, I love the way he worded it in his talk, he says, I seek to edify and not to offend. We never want to try to offend. Jesus says, it must be that offenses come. Yes, but we don't have to try. <laughs> We should always try to communicate that in as loving a way as possible. And, and respect people's agency as much as we possibly can, given the circumstances. I mean, as far as, as far as we are concerned, we need to respect people's agency. But more to the point, we should stand up and speak the truth, even if it hurts. And I, and I hope the Spirit can guide us as we try that. He says, let me share eternal truths that have become an anchor to my soul. He goes on to bear his testimony. With like 40 footnotes. <laughs> It's the most footnoted testimony in the history of General Conference. <laughs> I appreciate being on here to, to talk about these things and to be reminded and to come back to the point that this is, this is what it's about. It's about these fundamental truths of the gospel being instilled inside our hearts, seeking them out and feeling them and gaining a witness that these fundamental things are true, as he describes. And we hold nobody against their well inside the church. And we offer people who are outside of the church or who are struggling and mentally out of the church but physically remain, that they can feel this for the first time or they can feel this again, uh, that Jesus is the Christ, that he rose from the dead. He says, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to help us. Jesus taught us to do the Father's will and to love one another. He atoned for our sins and gave up his life on the cross. He arose from the dead after three days. Through Christ and his grace, we will be resurrected can be forgiven, and we can find strength in affliction. And, and that's, that's meaningful to me, that as complicated as our society can be, there are very simple, powerful truths that can change our lives. Well, thank you for that testimony. And thank you, of course, for jumping on the podcast. It's always a huge pleasure having you on and getting to see my old friends again. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discuss Elder Pingree's address, Eternal Truth, if you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you get podcasts. You can find the links to all of our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org, where you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, or learn more about us, your hosts. If you want to follow me, Matthew Watkins, you can find me at powerinthebook.com or on Twitter. My handle is joyfulrepenter. And big thanks to our podcast guest, Eric Wells, for joining us today. You can't follow him on Facebook because he's kind of a private person, but he's awesome. So if you happen to see him in Utah, 
give them a shout out. But remember, while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophets and apostles themselves. Although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions, for the which we invite you to tune in next week on the Conference Talk Podcast. <laughs>